and I'm going on mute. Me too. Okay, remember you guys are on mute, so when you have to talk. Hi, everyone. I see that there are people joining, um, joining in now. We are also live broadcasting um, onto Facebook. This will be recorded onto YouTube as well. Uh, welcome to the Hunger for Justice series. This is episode three, Decolonizing Africa's Food Future, uh, speaking with Million Belay and Timothy Wise. Before we begin, I want to go over some general housekeeping. You'll see there's a chat box area and a button marked Q&A. Please use the chat box to share amongst yourselves. We will also populate the chat with some resources. You'll see at the top there's a link to a, a public Google folder and our YouTube channel, and that holds the resources from today's episode. For To submit questions to our speakers, please use the Q&A button. The final 10 minutes of the program will be for a public question and answer, and you can submit your questions anytime before then. We have over 200 attendees today, so we do apologize. We will not be able to answer everyone's questions. We'll do our best to consolidate the questions and upload answers into the public resource folder. Uh, we've gathered significant content, including articles mentioned in today's presentation, links to learn more about our speaker's work, um, and collaborative videos um, that uh, Growing Culture and the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa um, have put together. Thank you so much for joining the series. You are part of this conversation about how we feed everyone in a post-COVID world. Your participation is essential in order to hear all voices. Please take our post-session survey at the end of this meeting. You can copy and paste um, the link from the URL that will be um, we'll put, be putting up in the chat box shortly. Your feedback helps shape future conversations and you'll be able to opt in to ways of continuing to the conversation as we build this community. This session is being recorded and we'll be uploading it for public viewing on the AGC YouTube channel. It is my pleasure to now introduce the founder and executive director of A Growing Culture, Lauren Cardelli. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'm so excited today to introduce Timothy Wise and Million Belay. Um, the, the interest behind this series has always been to kind of start to unveil um, some of the deeper issues within our food system. I can't think of two individuals that are better equipped to help in that process. Um, in, a, in a world where smallholder farmers are producing over 70% of the world's food supply on just 19% of cultivated land. In a world, in a global economy where Africa is producing much more than it is receiving, it bears um, questions that we have to be thinking about and asking ourselves, who's subsidizing who? Um, who's supporting who? Um, part of the series is to undergo that journey, to start listening to individuals, um, hearing stories, exploring case studies of resilience, and um, 
Timothy's book, Eating Tomorrow, um, be, you know, really went on that journey where he was able to um, traverse multiple continents and speak with researchers and academics um, and farmers and start to put together um, the picture of a global food system. Um, that global food system could be called broke. We like to think of it as um, operating as planned and that plan needs to change. Um, Million Belay is a hero of mine. Um, I started working with him some years ago. Uh, he founded Melka um, in Ethiopia and then went on to co find the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, which is the largest civil society organization in Africa. Um, Million has spearheaded multiple efforts um, and has really been uh, leading the charge for food sovereignty in the African context. And I'm so excited that we get to hear him today. He's also a member of IPES Foods, um, as well as several other entities. So without uh, any further pause, I want to take this moment to really um, thank the both of them for taking this time to share with us their stories and to allow Tim to take the mic. Oh, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, it's it's the it's great to see this the Hunger for Justice um, uh, series um, getting going, and it's um, an honor to get to be part of uh, of getting it off the ground. It is such an important time to be um, uh, to be talking about these issues. Um, I think the um, the the pandemic ha is just highlighting. Um, what many are calling, like you said, the 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 broken nature of our food systems, and um, and I th uh, I think the food system food systems have been operating in the interests of a very select group of people, and it, this opens up the possibilities for struggling to change um, in whose interests they're operating. The frame for the framework for this particular discussion, decolonizing Africa's food future, is is quite appropriate um, because um, Africa itself has become a very large net food importer um, after a lot of Western programs, including structural adjustment programs, have um, have have broken a lot of African countries' abilities to feed themselves. Um, the loss of pr food producing capacity in the pandemic, though, um, we need to be mindful that we really could be facing one of the most severe food crises um, that we've seen in our lifetimes if we don't act appropriately. And that's, that's reflective of the, of the ways that our food systems are, are, are failing. Um, um, for import dependent countries, those imports are often now not available or they're going to be available at a very high price. Um, um, they're now tied into global supply chains that are interrupted by this, uh, by this pandemic. Um, informal markets where a lot of consumers get most of their food in poor countries um, are, are disrupted. Um, and that's where a lot of um, the farmers get their incomes is from selling in those markets. So their incomes are disrupted. And most farmers, most farm, uh, farm households makes at least some of their living um, off the farm um, with family members working or selling in a lot of those informal networks. And those are often shut down now um, in the pandemic, de decreasing their access to incomes. Um, the, the, the idea of talking about this as, as decolonizing is not out of the blue. Um, I, when I was researching my book, I heard um, people referring to uh, the responses in recent years to the 2007 and 8 food price crisis as the new colonialism. That was the phrase that was often used. It was used to describe land grabbing um, as foreign investors would come in, swoop in and, and get land cheap from uh, governments desperate for investment. Um, often taking over old colonial plantations and turning them into new colonial plantations um, owned by the private sector. Um, it was used to refer to aid programs like the Obama era's um, uh, New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, which explicitly 
conditioned aid to African countries on their agreement to a set of um, reforms to their policies that would open their their economies and their countries to uh, seed companies and uh, and to foreign investment. Um, decried as new con the new conditionalities comparable to the World Bank and IMF's conditionalities of old, um, um, and it referred. It's been used to refer to programs like the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, um, which is promoting foreign seeds and fertilizers as the solution to uh, food insecurity in Africa. Um, I saw a lot of these in operation in Malawi, um, where uh, in 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 the in the course of researching my book. Malawi made a valiant effort to try to escape this food dependence after some failed harvests and being dependent on food aid by subsidizing small scale farmers, but subsidizing them to buy imported fertilizer and imported seeds. Um, and it worked in the short run, but it failed in the long run as the soils grew more acidic as fertilizers plowed into monocultures of corn just um, continue to produce uh, acidic and non-fertile soils. Um, but the government was so committed to these projects that they, as part of the reform process, included seed policy reforms that really threatened the rights of small-scale farmers to save and exchange and sell their own seeds. 80% of the food produced in Africa comes from farmers saving and producing from their own seeds. Um, I even had a um, uh, was arguing with that policy about a defender of it, and and I said this policy is so bad it could have been written by Monsanto. And he actually looked at his shoes and looked up at me and said, "Well, actually, um, a Monsanto's head of operations in Malawi was one of the co-authors of the policy." That kind of involvement in um, in Africa's food systems is. A, is a, and, and responding to Africa's food needs today is why it's being decried as the new colonialism. The new colonialism now comes with a corporate brand often. Um, and, and that's why I'm so happy that we're, I'm here with Million Bele, who I've done a lot of work with in recent years um, on some of these issues, because there's no one better to, to answer the question um, how is Africa's food system um, colonized, and who are the who are the main actors carrying out its colonization, its continued colonization today? So maybe let me let me pass the mic to uh, to Mignon. Million, I believe your, uh, sorry, this is Julia from AGC. I believe your. Um, yes, 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 I can see now. Sorry. So I was saying thank you to you and Lauren and to Tim also. Um, somebody said in a row that um, the first colonizers have used the three states to colonize Africa um, the Christianity commerce and civilization. This was the agenda that they've justified uh, to colonize Africa. I'm not going to go uh, deep into them because uh, a lot of uh, uh, writers have written about colonization um, much, much better than me. But what I am trying to do is how a new form of narrative is used to colonize Africa's food system. Um, agriculture is very critical for Africa, as you know. Um, overall, uh, on average, uh, more than 30 percent of Africans are engaged in agriculture. In some countries like Ethiopia, uh, it's more than 80 percent of the people. So for the last, you know, thousands of years, uh, Africans were doing agriculture. Um, they have uh, an accumulated knowledge about agriculture. Uh, they have seeds, uh, they have um, the, the livestock, uh, they have the, maintained the diversity around them for a very, very long time. 
Um, and agriculture is also the source of our economy. So we need to make sure that this sector of our economy is um, in the right way. It is transformed in the right way. Um, but what's happening now is a narrative is formed. A narrative is formed and this narrative is repeated again and again and again and again uh, to the point where it has become the DNA of uh, most of the actors who are involved with, uh, in African agriculture. And they talk about African transforming African agriculture. When they talk about transforming African agriculture, they are talking about in terms of this narrative. The narrative, uh, the first narrative is, um, you know, African governments and African farmers could not uh, manage agriculture. So business has to manage agriculture for them. So for that, you know, a lot of uh, laws and regula regulations are changed. You've uh, talked about uh, how Monsanto um, kind of wrote the seed laws of Malawi. That's a, a typical example. And I myself have participated in uh, various for us where in terms of harmo harmonizing seed laws and seed regulations in Africa, uh, aid agencies have a kind of uh, um, brought consultants to really write seed laws and seed regulations, biosafety regulations, for example. Um, the biosafety regulations are, are designed to weaken Africans' resistance to GMO, the importation of GMOs. So business was given a paramount and our African seeds are demonized. You know, uh, they say that African, Africans cannot produce more because of their seeds. So, so therefore we need to uh, bring uh, high yielding varieties. So uh, because of that, we've, we're losing at a rapid rate our seeds and the knowledge associated with them. Um, agrochemicals, you know, they say Africans cannot produce their food without agrochemicals. So, uh, we have become a market for um, fertilizers which are imported from outside and also pesticides, you know, a lot of herbicides uh, are, are implemented or used by our farmers now. Land, you know, in the land issue, uh, land in African hand or in the hands of Africans is not productive, so we have to uh, give it to um, external actors of the rich inside, uh, inside our own continents so that they produce more. And that's driving uh, land grabbing. Um, they, and African food needs is termed, I mean, uh, framed in terms of calories. You know, what you need is more calorie. So the focus is on producing more food. It's not on uh, producing nutritious food. It's not on produce, producing healthy food without affecting the environment. It's not about producing uh, culturally appropriate food. Uh, food produced in a just way, you know, but it is more and more calories. And more and more what's coming is African agriculture should be market-based, you know, the market should rule African agriculture. So instead of uh, an agriculture based on diversity, diversity of knowledge and practices, we are pushed to produce for the market certain high-value crops. So in this way, in this way, um, this, because of this, this, uh, this narrative, the business seeds, agrochemicals, land and calories and market-based narratives, uh, there, there is a colonization and there's a transformation of African agriculture into a path, which we will find in the near future difficult to extract, extricate ourselves from. And there are a range of actors who are, who are uh, part of this. There are philanthrocapitalists, as you know, um, um, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and you know these kind of people. Um, there are aid agencies who, who are part of part of these agendas. Uh, most of the biosafety regulations are um, kind of supported and directed by USAID, as we know. Um, and also governments, you know, the bilateral agreements in the, among governments also is uh, led by this narrative. Um, the elites in Africa and agricultural elites in Africa are part of this and some parts of the government. So this is, this is an organized um, and, uh, uh, and a directed um, colonizing effort. That's how we see it. And our agenda, our decolonizing agenda is an agroecology and I'll speak uh, later about that.
Yeah, well, maybe you could talk about that. I know I've, AFSA members are, um, are a diverse group of, uh, of organizations from farmers to consumers, um, but how, are, how is AFSA strategizing um, this resistance to, to this new, new colonialism? Okay, let me, uh, with your permission, let me share some few slides uh, for this. Um, um, Hello. Hello. Do you see the slides? Do you hear me? Uh, I I can't quite see your slides in the right form. There you go. Okay, good. So the, I am, as you have introduced me, I'm the general coordinator of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Uh, people you know, if you want to know more about the Alliance, there is a website down there. Um, Alliance is, you know, the biggest uh, social movement in Africa. Out of the 55 countries in Africa, we work in 50 of them. We have pastoralists and official folks, uh, farmers, um, um, faith-based institutions, women networks, youth networks, um, indigenous NGOs, you know, consumer networks as members. So it is a broad-based uh, 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 organization, and we are pushing for agroecology. But we, before we decided to work on agroecology, uh, we started to collect case studies. You know, agroecology. You know, in a, you know without any complicated definition of agroecology, it's a, a means of uh, uh, life, it's a way of life, which produces more food, um, nutritious food, healthy food, uh, in an environment-friendly way, uh, uh, without the, you know, culturally appropriate way and, and in a just way. And it's a science, it's a practice, and, and, and it's a movement. So we wanted to know whether agroecology works in Africa. Uh, so what we did was we collected number of cases on agroecology, on land and soil, on pastoralism, and on seed sovereignty. Uh, you can find the cases uh, on this website. And these are the cases from all over Africa. Uh, and also we have uh, collaborated with other institutions like the Oakland Institute also to produce more cases. Uh, one case, for example, is uh, from, uh, from Ethiopia, from uh, uh, Highland Ethiopia, the northern part of Ethiopia called Tigray. In Tigray, there was a project uh, coordinated by the Institute for Sustainable Development uh, uh, project. And uh, what the Institute did with the collaboration with the, with the government uh, is to uh, have plots of land with farmers, on one plot, is, there is no input, and there is no organic input or inorganic input. On another, there is inorganic input fertilizers, artificial fertilizers. And on another, uh, there is a soil and water conservation activity, uh, increasing the plant biomass by, by planting trees and grasses, and also using compost, using the, the material that is produced. As you can see, for critical crops in Ethiopia, bay, barley, durum wheat, maize, teff, and faba bean, the productivity, I think for the, uh, the first two uh, to three years, it was better for chemical fertilizers. But later on, over 10 years and 15 years, as you can see, the brown uh, is a color of, uh, of the organic production. You can see that through organic or um, 
or agroecological ways of production, the farmers could increase their pro productivity much more than the other ways of doing. So from all the cases, from all the cases, uh, over 50, 60 cases, uh, and what we've learned is we did a meta-analysis. So it is possible to increase production because uh, there are people who say that, you know, it's very difficult to increase uh, productivity through agroecological methods, but it's our I mean, experience that it is possible to increase production. That's what farmers told us. And what's very, very good is the food produce, produced is nutritious and healthy. And the environment is not polluted by, by, by chemicals. And, um, and in most of the ways, you know, through soil and uh, conservation activities, the environment is even much better. And the uh, food produces produce this culturally uh, appropriate food. And farmers do own their seeds, their land, especially their life, you know. And food producers, in most of the cases, have organized themselves uh, both to uh, organize their life uh, as well as to resist the imposition from others. And also, you know, we use the, um, um, the uh, global or international policy environment to see how those cases, those over 50, 60 cases, fare when uh, we compare them with the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and we found that they meet at least the 17 SDGs. And I was uh, uh, doing a presentation at Yale University in the US and I was asked by the students and they said, why not all of them, 17 SDGs? And, then, and I couldn't agree more. So agroecological way of production uh, can meet the sustainable development goals. I want to leave you with this very, very fascinating uh, slide. Um, as who has the best overall dietary pattern, it says, you know, who has the best diets in the world it's globally? It's a global comparison. The more greener it is, it is the best, and the more uh, red or yellow it is, it is, it's not good. So as you can see, uh, as compared to North America, some Latin American countries, even in Asia, African, Africa has a healthy diet. And even looking at the map of uh, Africa, uh, as you can see, the, the northern part in the, the southern tip is a little bit yellow because there's a lot of uh, industrial agriculture there. But in, the, in, in between where farmers are still practicing the traditional forms of farming, now increasingly agroecological, then as you can see, the food system is, is much better than any other country. And so where are we transferring to? Transforming to, I mean. Where are we transitioning to? We have a healthy food system. We can learn from our healthy food system as compared to the rest of the globe. So we, we need to keep this. But it does not mean that we stay there. You know, agroecology is science. Agroecology is a practice based on science. And agroecology is social movement. So it's also about improving how the farmers are working through scientific ways uh, in, the, in the combining farmers' knowledge and the knowledge available from science. Yeah, no, I think that uh, I'm glad yeah, you no, pointed no. that out, uh, Million, because the, um, I know that um, a lot of the attacks on agroecology that we've seen um, come from um, Western leaders who are, are trying to paint it as just backward as just a return to the past. But I know a lot of AFSA's programs are really focused on, on bringing innovation, on, on, on integrating farmer, inter integrating science with farmers' traditional knowledge and practices. Maybe you could talk about some of that. Yeah, uh, we have um, four really, really exciting programs now under the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Uh, the first is what we call healthy soil and healthy food. And soil is very, very critical. And people talk about brown revolution instead of uh, doing it. We are mapping now um, the scientific and uh, traditional ways of um, enriching soil 
in, in, in African countries, West Africa, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa. And uh, we, we, we are, uh, I mean, creating an environment, uh, farmers, where, where farmers in this, in this part of the continent learn from each other and combine and do the best. Uh, now we are working with uh, over 20 countries and over 20 farmers um, to, to really develop a mechanism of improving soil and develop the capacity in Africa where we can use them to also promote um, agroecological ways of production. That's one product. The second is people talk about uh, as if we are uh, against uh, uh, um, I mean, entrepreneurship or, or business or whatever, but uh, we are now uh, um, mapping out agroecological entrepreneurs in Africa. A lot of agricultural entrepreneurs in Africa want to map them and want to understand the kind of product that they produce, the kind of market that they have, the kind of challenge that they have, and uh, with the hope of promoting them and also um, uh, creating an environment where they can uh, work together with the, those who can support them to increase uh, their productivity uh, and also improve their, their handling of their products. Um, the third pro program is what we call uh, producing an African food policy. So there will be a policy discussion in uh, as, many as, as many African countries as possible, at least 20, where uh, farmers, you know, fisher folk, pastoralists, you know, academicians, citizens, government come together to discuss about their food system. And also we run, we'll run a parallel process at the African Union level. And based uh, um, on this ground up discussion and discussion at the higher level, we are hoping to, uh, you know, with the African Union to produce an African food policy. That's the third program. And the fourth is we are organizing a, a big uh, campaign to, to promote agroecology as African way of talking uh, to climate change. You know, people talk only about uh, adaptation when they, talk, when they talk about agroecology, but uh, agroecology is a fantastic uh, mitigation mechanism also. So we are, we are campaigning. So these are the, the four projects that we are doing. Are you, uh, I know, I know that one of the, the projects you've been most excited about has been the, um, the training programs to try to help African farmers um, use local resources to develop their own biofertilization in, in, as an alternative to um, imported synthetic fertilizers. Can you talk yeah, about the biofertilizers are part of the components, you know? Um, now we are exploring how, you know, uh, over 600,000 uh, farmers in India are doing their farming, their methodology, and the biofertilizers is one of them. And there are some methods that African farmers are doing also, you know? Uh, so that's what I, I mean by creating this environment where uh, African farmers and those who are working on, on soil will exchange their practices and come out with a, a strategy that fits their own, own condition, you know, their own context. The bigger problem this, uh, of this colonizing approach is that it's, uh, it's, uh, they see Africa as one. That's a big problem. When they talk about Europe, they talk about UK, um, uh, Sweden, England, I mean, um, Germany, whatever. But when they talk about Africa, they talk about as if it is one thing, one continent. There's a lot of diversity in Africa and we want to respect and acknowledge this diversity and all of the methodologies that are uh, going to be applied, uh, even in one country, are applied according to the context. So th that's what we are doing. No, that's. Uh, uh, I think it's so important. I was shocked. I was surprised as I when I was researching my book at how um, how it, how much the the aid community was um, following the sort of one size fits all um, process. And and many agronomists have demonstrated that even on a single farm, a single small farm, yeah. soils vary, 
from one part of the of the plot to another, and that the, applying the same the same type of inputs to all of those is just not going to be productive. No, no, I, I you know what I did. You know, I personally did some, some research. Um, and I, let me tell you my experience in Tigray, in the northern uh, part of Ethiopia. I walked, you know, the transect walk. We did the transect walk. I walked um, about 500 to one kilometer. I don't remember it exactly. And the diversity in soil is astounding. And farmers could tell me in, in each of the, uh, the what kind of crop that they're, they're, they're planting in that particular kind of soil, how they treat that, that, that soil, what kind of uh, pests attack that kind of soil, um, and so forth, so on and so forth. So you, you see programs, for example, you know, we map the soil of Africa and we give this map to the soil and we'll educate farmers how to treat the soil. This is quite a joke. They know their soil in some detail. So let's, let's respect that knowledge and bring in the science so that they work together. So instead of this uh, blanket approach. Yeah, no, I, I'm, well, talk a little bit. I mean, let's get back to the new colonialism though for a minute. I mean, you and I were together last fall in Seattle for a, a great event at Seattle Town Hall, but we did take the opportunity to visit the Gates Foundation's Welcome Center. And I, I remember, um, uh, your astonishment as you looked at their um, their beautiful display of of their soil health program, among other programs they were doing in Africa, and and how it was all about uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, and other inputs. Yeah, I mean, um, you not know, to give credit to the organization that they are supporting in uh, Ethiopia called the uh, Agricultural transformation uh, agency they are doing soil mapping you know and instead of uh, applying the same kind of thing uh, i mean chemicals everywhere they want to, to really map the soil and see which chemical fits what you know uh, that's much better than this blanket approach but um it's again top down um uh, it doesn't respect the diversity in the soil at the at even and you know, one, one acre level or one hectare or soil level. Uh, it doesn't recognize the farmer's knowledge about soil. Uh, and it, it, it just, it, there is some, some, some kind of, uh, you know, um, bombastic about it, which says, you know, we map the soil and we'll tell uh, farmers what to do. Uh, so as I said, you know, um, we are talking about the speaking of the two forms of language, you know? It's not a total rejection of science, it should be there, but, but let's recognize, you know, let's understand that farmers were there. They've been, they live there, they see the change, you know? So they, 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 they tradi trans, I mean, intergenerational transformation of knowledge, and also knowledge that they gain every respect that. That's what we are saying. And, I didn't see anything that respects this knowledge in that exhibition uh, site. No, I didn't either. Um, and the, I mean, it's striking because the Gates Foundation, of course, initiated the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa in 2006. Um, it's put about two thirds of a billion dollars into that initiative. Um, African governments are throwing collectively another $1 billion a year behind subsidies to fertilizers and, and commercial seeds. And yet they're just not getting much in the way of results um, using all that money. What I was struck by, and I wonder if maybe you could talk about is are the kinds of ways that government um, uh, could better support the kinds of small scale um, bottom up initiatives that AFSA is supporting. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, we, uh, it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of gray shades, as you, as, as you know. It's not a black and white thing. There are a lot of gray shades. Uh, there are a lot of attention uh, to small-scale farmers. Um, you know, countries are trying to increase their commitment to CADAP, which uh, asks for, uh, you know, African countries to uh, allocate 10% of the GDP to agriculture. 
but where does that money goes? You know, that 10% is, is a very interesting question. As we know, um, most of the aids from, from uh, outside uh, does not go to agroecology. And there was a recent study that done by the um, by CAWR and also by Ovision, by IPS Food, you know, a new, a new publication. And it shows that, you know, it's only a fraction of the aid that's coming to Africa, that is, that's coming for African agriculture. That's actually allocated to uh, agroecology. Most of it is to what, what I said before, to um, productivist agriculture. An agriculture solely based on more calories, you know. Now, when it gets to your... Well, no, no rejecting uh, production, production. There's no, there needs to be production, but, but nutrition should be there, health should be there, environment should be there, um, endoculture and, and justice should be there. No, and I think the one of the things that I that I saw um, in in many countries in Africa is that the these sorts of aid programs like the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa are really focused on a very small number of crops. Um, in many parts of Eastern and Southern Africa, for example, it's corn, maize, um, and that comes at a at a cost because it decreases actually decreases the diversity of crops grown in the field. Um, they're only measuring productivity by measuring the yields of of corn, right? Not the yields of food that come out of the out of the field. And exactly. the loss of traditional crops has been dramatic. I know you've seen that. No, I mean, in terms of erosion of our seeds, and I do remember going to one community in 2010 um, and asking them, you know, how many varieties of barley they had. They said 19. And how many barley varieties do you have now? Five. You see? Uh, but the good thing is this, these varieties that they have lost are in people's houses. Um, they are not promoted. But if you really, really work to, with African farmers to, to bring in those seeds, they can bring them out. They are out there. Uh, Diversity-based agriculture is producing wonders in India, for example. Um, and in, in, in the context of climate change and COVID, you know, COVID, we didn't talk about COVID. So this is a very, very critical context that, that it is giving us, you know? Who, what kind of farmers would survive under this kind of lockdowns, uh, when trade is cut, you know, if you if you push farmers to produce only for the market, when something about uh, happens to the market, then they are um, vulnerable. You see, they are compromised. But if the food system is localized and if they have their di diverse seeds, diverse ways of working, when this kind of shocks, I think the shocks would would, would be much more worse in the future. That's what is a pro the prediction, both climate and this kind of uh, un, uh, un, uh, unexpected shocks. Then farmers have uh, you know a fallback position, you see. But now uh, what COVID tells us is that, that we have to based on that, based on this. But if we have this kind of narratives and these actors that I've mentioned push one form of transformation of African agriculture, then it would be a problem. Yeah, no, I think that's, I, I'm glad you brought us back to the, to the pandemic emergency, um, because the, I think one of the, among the things that's highlighted are just um, how, how vulnerable um, developing countries are, and all of us are really, to global supply chains that have, are dominated by just a few large corporations. When they get in trouble and their supply chains um, are threatened, we're all threatened. But, but diver I really liked the way that um, the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems framed the challenge of, of transforming our food systems by calling it a path from uniformity to diversity. And I think that's a really useful way to think about it. Our, yeah. our global system is promoting uh, uniform crops, uniform um, uh, food systems dominated by a few companies. And I think the alternative that, that AFSA and others are promoting is really 
um, uh, diversity in all its forms, a diversity of import sources, a diversity of supplies for different kinds of foods, a diversity of foods, a diversity of crops in the field. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I like that report, you know, it was a very good report. And um, uh, one of the lock-ins, you know, we have identified eight lock-ins. One of the lock-ins is past dependency. Yeah. Uh, which actually means that once you've gone to, to a path, it's very difficult to go out of it. That's what our farmers say. Farmers started to apply um, agrochemicals and use high yielding varieties and use certain ways of managing the land. Even if they want to go to agroecology, it's very difficult for them to do so. So past de dependency is very much dangerous. Yeah, and I think the 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 danger, I mean, the, the opportunity um, that Africa has is to actually resist stepping onto that industrial agriculture path um, because most of the food is still grown by small-scale farmers. Most yeah. of the food is still grown on diverse um, uh, farms, and most of the food is still... Um, is still produced locally. So there's the opportunity to resist that push to uh, addict farmers. I mean, many of them likened it, likened it to drug dealers, um, you know, seed subsidies and fertilizer subsidies. The first drugs are always free, they say, yeah. and then you get addicted to them. Um, I think AFSA, it seems like AFSA is really focused on trying to keep keep African farmers from becoming addicted to those those external inputs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, um, um, it's it's a it's a very very challenging initiative uh, because you cannot ask a farmer to stop today to 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 produce uh, uh, to stop the uh, industrial kind of agriculture way and produce agroecological way. That's very difficult to do. Uh, for example, the government would give you assistance for over three years for you to convert your farm from conventional to organic or agroecological. But we don't have that kind of mechanism. Yeah. So that's what, you know, what, what we are lobbying for is for farmers who want to transition to agroecology to be given this kind of support. Otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disaster for farmers, you know. Uh, to transition from one system to another system because they don't have uh, uh, three years to wait and they don't have uh, money to, uh, you know, till the, their agroecological, their uh, land is converted into agroecological. So, so support is needed physically. Yeah, and I think the, um, I mean, I was struck in all of my research for the book that that policymakers, national governments are just ignoring the low cost, uh, ecological sustainable solutions that are all around them offered by their their own farmers and instead opting for these very expensive policies that mm. not only are taking taking farming and agriculture in in a dangerous direction they're actually not even working they're not even getting the productivity gains that they claim they can get with these inputs yeah i think uh, you know there was a big meeting um beginning of this week and uh, which is called a, a, a Salzburg um, convening or Salzburg conference which has happened for over three days and there were over 300 participants in one of the recommendations of that big gathering which involved a lot of scientists in civil society government and the business you know recommendation is to think about the kind of subsidies that you give uh, both in the north, you know, a subsidy is a very political agenda because it's one of the elements that makes Africa farmers uh, competition with the northern farmers quite difficult to do. And also the subsidies come to, you know, the artificial fertilizers in um, other ways. We need, we actually need to, to subsidize if we have to agroecological farmers for the transition you know, for the transition to, to agroecology. That, that's very, very much important. Yeah, in the United States, that's being now discussed. Um, not enough, um, but in the Democratic primary, we heard a lot from some of the candidates about 
the ways that a different kind of agriculture could come out of uh, a, a green a green new deal a uh, new set of uh, priorities on transitioning the the entire country toward a uh, a more climate resilient um, future yeah yeah maybe let's hear to people's question and see you know what 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 people what people say yeah but yeah I totally agree with you yeah um, I think uh, we have um, Growing culture is curating questions for us so that we can uh, um, we can sort through them all. Uh, I know we won't be able to get to all of them, but I mean, one um, is um, whether the de the decisions to allow to bring in patented seeds is made by politicians, and how how do concerned citizens make influences um, when the decisions are made without consulting farmers? Uh, question from that... someone in Ethiopia. Yes, yes, uh, um, I know Matalo is, is a friend. I think um, uh, the only way to do is to, to organize, 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 and uh, resist uh, based on the you know, thousands of research papers that are available, you know, on knowledge, uh, and, and also ad, you know, do advocacy. Um, I know that there are a lot of government people, people working in government, who, who are as concerned as us, so we have to meet these people and we have to make this advocacy both at the national level and at the regional level because it's the regional level decisions uh, which are implemented at the local level. So we need to work on, that, on those levels. Uh, another question um, came from Amara. How do you measure the best overall dietary pattern? I think referring to what you uh, what you referred to in your presentation on the map. How were they? Uh, what were they measuring? Basically, uh, this is not my research. I have to I have to say I got this uh, slide uh, from a scientist uh, of resilience presentation during the FAO. Uh, negotiation on uh, uh, nutrition and food systems. Um, so I got that slide from that. So this is not my work. So I cannot uh, give you the details for that. But it does, uh, I'll add though, that um, what it's basically measuring is not um, the adequacy of food, because Africa clearly suffers from um, uh, a lot of people do not have enough food. I think it was measuring the um, the, the quality of the diet. That yeah, is, yeah, they, the, yeah. the range of foods and the extent to which they're dominated less by processed foods, uh, dominated um, less by uh, single industrialized um, crops like like maize and more diverse yeah. in nature. And that's why it shows up as a, as a you know, people talk about the Mediterranean diet being being a healthy diet. This is saying that actually Africa's um, many African countries have a have a diet that is is better than the Western um, norm. Yeah. Um, yeah the follow up question is is on um, uh, is what the corporate narrative is, um, how that feeds that uh, that that approach. Um, um, sort of how do we address the corporate narrative that people are food insecure and that and that it's because we don't adopt their west their high yield agriculture yeah i think uh, the graph the diagram is not about uh, access to um it's not a better nutrition access access actually means uh, you know economic access physical access it's that uh, you know, food security has, uh, has four pillars. One of those pillars, which has come after the study of uh, Amarta said, is access, access to nutrition. It, this talks about availability of nutritious food. Um, if you could, um, you know, if you could work with farmers' knowledge about nutritious food, if you could increase that, then the, if, you, if you could improve their physical and economic access, then they can access that nutritious food. And instead of dumping um, food, which is not nutritious into the continent, the, the, the diagram shows that the food is there, it's nutritious, and how, how do we support that, that system? 
That's the question. It's not about food security. Um, another question um, comes from Robert. How strategically does AFSA communicate with the farmers who've moved away from traditional agriculture, African agriculture, to more reliance from chemical inputs? How do you work with them to try to um, bring them, uh, get them off that technology treadmill? Yeah, as I said, um, in the near future, it will, it will be very difficult to, for, for people to change from one agricultural system to another because they don't have a passion. Uh, but in the future, it is possible. And the best way of doing that is to have examples uh, all over Africa uh, to show that you can increase productivity and your food can be nutritious and healthy without affecting the environment, all the things that I said. And that's why, that, that's why we, we call it cases. And also I've talked about this uh, space that we have created for farmers to share their knowledge um, um, around soils, you know, that experience. So that experience will be shared. By the way, AFSA is network of networks. It's a network of networks. So we work with our networks and our networks work with thousands of uh, ground level civil society uh, and social movements in Africa. So, you know, the best thing that we are doing is to mobilize the base and also um, uh, support information filter down to the base. That's how we do it. Yeah, I know to add to that, um, the, I think one of the ways that I saw um, it's that the question is really about the how do you transition farmers who are already kind of addicted to those green revolution inputs to give them up. One is to end all those subsidies for them in Africa, a billion dollars a year going to um, yeah, yeah, subsidized yeah. purchases. Mm -hmm. And that's really in many ways the only reason farmers continue to use them. But the other is that once you have to start paying for inputs yourself as a farmer, you can't afford them and you really want to cut your costs of production. So there's a really strong argument for farmers to reduce their costs of production by adopting um, lower input agriculture. And there's yeah. a farm, farmers see real benefits in, the, in a very short term from reducing those, those costs because they don't have access to a lot of cash to buy these kinds of yeah, they have. Yeah, this has to be done very slowly. That's what I'm saying, you know? It's not a one night um, approach. Um, uh, one more question from Rachel. Could you speak more about the role of national agriculture policies in changing the path countries are following? Are there specific countries that are effectively resisting the industrial agriculture model um, and embracing agroecology and what has driven their success. And Jan, I think you saw some of that in India recently, right? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, in India, in one part of India, uh, not in all over India, in Andhra Pradesh, um, uh, they have worked, you know, the Andhra Pradesh project, you know, they, they have worked uh, with thousands of um, self-help groups. There were a lot of self-help groups. Uh, they've worked with them. Uh, they have trained them in a very simple uh, method of producing uh, uh, a methodology of feeding the soil. Uh, so b based on that, based on the um, uh, experiences with the small farmers, then slowly but surely they have uh, included some into the, the initiative. So, um, yeah, that I think we can we can uh, we can talk about that. But in the case of Africa, uh, the way of agroecology is coming slowly but surely. I think one country that we can uh, mention that that is trying its best to move into this direction is is Senegal. Uh, now also the I mean uh, the ECOWAS countries countries in uh, West Africa are moving uh, to this direction supported by some governments like the, the, the French government in, uh, supported by uh, some research uh, centers. So that's happening, but slowly. Yeah, I think the, the other thing that, that I think um, can really change the path countries are following is if the, in, the, in the United States and in the Western world where donors, where we're, we're providing 
donor money to a lot of these countries for their agricultural policies is to is to end the, the priority being given to um, to these input subsidy programs and green revolution programs, which sucks up so much money. Um, and that's particularly tragic in, in light of the pandemic when public health measures and um, food security measures really need to be emphasized in, in government budgets and they don't have a lot of money to spend. So it's, um, we could make a big difference in the global north if our, if our governments would stop insisting that, um, that aid go to these unproductive projects. Yeah. I want to thank you guys so much for sharing this exciting dialogue. Um, one of the, the things that was on my, in my head during this conversation was uh, a grown culture was fortunate enough to work with AFSA recently, and we did some, some video and storytelling projects. And there was um, a woman in Uganda um, who um, was organizing seed saving groups. And there's an amazing organizations out there that AFSA mm. was supporting. And um, we went to, to speak with her and she showed me these, these groundnut seeds. Um, and these groundnut seeds were extremely nutritious. They were drought tolerant, right? And um, when I was asking about them, she said that uh, during the, um, the terror scare of, of Joseph Kony, um, when the communities had to be put into internal displacement camps, um, which were internal like refugee camps, um, there her family had very little warning. And what she grabbed um, to go to these camps were the seed. Those were the family heirlooms. Those were the knowledge and the local resilience. And that was more important than anything else. Um, and so the work that AFSA is doing out there is to really, um, it's so vital because it's, it's supporting um, the networks to save this seed, save these communities and save these stories to integrate them with science and advance an agroecological model that um, feeds their community, feeds themselves, feeds their soil, and, and feeds the world. And I think that is um, extremely um, important and, and the most timely work right now. Um, AFSA has launched a Agroecology for Climate Action um, campaign. I want to encourage you all to follow them and um, to support that movement that they're creating. Um, I want to thank our amazing sponsors um, last episode, which was um, Milgram and Dascom Law Firm and Eat Your Way Clean Food Blog. Um, we can't do this without them. Um, and um, the next week's episode um, is going to be really interesting. It's with Elizabeth Henderson and Laura Lennick on agricultural justice for U.S. farmers and farm workers. Elizabeth Henderson is a farmer and one of the founders of the Agricultural Justice Project. Um, the strongest food justice certification in the United States. Uh, incredible farms are lined up, including Soul Fire um, and Pie Farm. And um, as I really want to take this chance to thank Timothy and Million, I want to give them uh, and, uh, and ask if they have any closing remarks. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's a pity that we didn't get the time to answer, uh, um, hopefully, you know, all, but most of the question. Uh, I hope we'd uh, respond to you also through emails, probably. You can contact us. Uh, thanks for coming for this event, and thanks also for the organizers. And thank you, Tim, for asking great questions. Thank you. No, I, it's, this was a real pleasure. Um, uh, these things are, these these gatherings are, I think give us all hope in a, in the in the, this time of crisis and um, become all the more important not just for keeping up our own spirits but for also trying to figure out how to direct our um, collective efforts toward um, toward toward taking advantage of the opportunities to to shift our priorities in in our economies in our government policies and in our food systems. 
um, coming out of the crisis. So thanks to Growing Culture for focusing on this. Thank you. Um, please, everybody, we sent resources. Um, we'll, on the thank you email, we'll send them again, a link to resource pack. Um, please check out um, Tim's book, Eating Tomorrow, um, and please follow AFSA on all their channels. Um, I can't be more excited for the series, um, the upcoming sessions, and to learn together as we um, challenge these false narratives around our food system and um, collectivize the in innovation and democratize that information, which organizations like AFSA are really doing out there. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to say goodbye to our speakers now. Um, we will keep the session open for another few minutes to gather any final remarks from the chat box. Um, but um, if so, if you have any final remarks or final questions, we'll be gathering them. Again, you have links to the Hunger for Justice public resource folder. Um, all the links are found in the chat box, so you'll be able to access them there too. Uh, please check out the recording on the YouTube channel. It'll be up later today. If you have any direct questions, you can also um, email me, uh, Julia at a growing culture.org. Great, I'll be logging off now. We've saved the chat, we've gathered the questions. Thank you guys so much for attending and have a wonderful day.